Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the Sales Leaders Playbook. For the final episode of the 33 CXO series, today we welcome a very special guest, the current president and CEO of MongoDB and the visionary founder of Blade Logic, Dave Ichiera. In this episode, we discover the focus and the mindset of a legendary figure in the tech sales world. This is his playbook. CXOs, we investigate one of the greatest success stories in the history of software sales. 33 CXOs learnt the playbook from one man, John McMahon, a legacy which stretches back to the late 90s at a company called PTC. They were later reunited at Blade Logic, which was acquired by BMC. What happened next was truly remarkable. These CXOs went on to become the most prolific sales leaders in the software industry. They've raised over 22 billion in VC funding. They contribute to 4% of software turnover globally, 26 unicorns, eight decacorns, and the companies they drive have a combined valuation of 230 billion. At Hunters and Unicorn, we're revealing their playbook. Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the final episode of the final season of the 33 CXOs. Today, we welcome a very special guest. I'm Simon Kutis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Hey, everyone. And today, we have the current president and CEO of MongoDB, advisor at multiple startups, former VC, inspirational leader, six-time IPO, multiple acquisitions, and of course, the visionary founder behind the greatest success story in the history of software sales, Blade Logic. Today, we welcome David Cherrier. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Oliver. That was quite a setup. <laughs> Thank you. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show, Dave. It's my pleasure to be here. It really is a great privilege and an honor. Uh, and Dave, I know that you have seen a few of the episodes that we have been recording, but for the last year, we've spent a lot of time in this very seat talking to some of the most prolific sales leaders for some of the most exciting technology companies in the world. And none of this would have been possible had it not been for Blade Logic, which this, this whole podcast series is really dedicated to. We sit here today and we really do wonder, have you actually had the time to sit back and reflect on the significant impact that a small Boston-based startup has actually had on the entire tech sales industry? When you frame it like that, um, not really, but when, when you do think about it, I'm very proud of the impact Blade Logic has had on so many people and the reputation it has, especially uh, with its sales force. And obviously that reputation has manifested itself by so many people having so, so much influence and leadership positions in so many different software companies. So you feel very proud of being part of that organization. And obviously I cannot take credit for all that success. I had a great team and obviously, you know, John McMahon, who you've already spoken to was a key part of making that happen. Yeah, so, so we've obviously spent a lot of time um, with, with many of these sales leaders and there are obviously common traits and, and this series is very much about uncovering the playbook and, and, and the kind of the, the, hist the, the, the common traits behind the repeatable success. And by identifying that, it's really about learning and passing that, that message on to, to, to the wider kind of community. But at the time... Did you feel as though there was something special? Did you, did you have the chance to kind of look around and realize that these guys have the potential to go on and achieve the incredible things that they have? Well, I would say that um, the early days were quite rocky. So I, I don't want to suggest that we knew you were going to be a huge success story. Um, frankly, um, I joke with, with you know, my close friends and my wife that 
you know, the first couple of years, I thought I might get fired every quarter. If you remember, um, you know, 2001, when we started Blade Logic was a very difficult time in tech. Um, the tech bubble had just burst, the 9-11 had happened. And so uh, raising capital was, was really expensive. In fact, we as a company only raised 29 million in total, and we had 7 million in the bank when we filed to go public and building a direct sales force, which is not cheap. And we did that all basically by being incredibly efficient as well as using, frankly, customer revenue to finance the business. And so that was, uh, um, but it, was, it wasn't easy. I, I, you know, looking back now, it may seem like, oh, wow, that was a great success, but the early days were fraught with risk. Um, and uh, there are many times, you know, I wondered if we could pull this off, but uh, fortunately we did. Yeah, absolutely. The rest is history. And actually, we are going to spend a bit of time going, going deeper around Blade Logic because it was an incredible journey, so many ups and downs, and obviously a lot of success on the back of that. But actually, I also want to go um, start off by going to the present day because currently, uh, Dave, you are at one of the hottest technology companies in the world, a company with such incredible success and really making waves. Uh, and I suppose it's been a difficult couple of years. It's been a difficult year for, you know, for, for, for the world as we know it. And a lot has changed um, as a result of, 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 those, of those changes. And the digital landscape as we know it is obviously now very different. And, and MongoDB has an important part to play in that world. What, what can you tell us about uh, why MongoDB is in, in such a good position for, 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 for that evolving digital world that, we, uh, that we're living in? Well, it's a cliche now to say that every company is becoming a software company. And I think when you look back at 2020, that'll be the year that put the exclamation point on the need for businesses to really reinvent themselves using software and data. So as the world becomes increasingly digital first, what's clear is actually there's no off the shelf software that organizations can buy to differentiate themselves against the competition. And what I mean by that is you can't buy Salesforce, you can't buy Workday, you can't buy Okta to create a competitive advantage. And it's not that they're bad companies. In fact, they're excellent companies, but your competition can buy those products as well. So how do you really differentiate? So if you cannot buy a competitive advantage, you actually have to build yourself. And to build your differentiated future using software and data, you have to maximize the productivity of your developers. And when you look at developers, the most amount of time they spend is managing data. Managing data is a developer's most challenging problem and the biggest drain on their productivity. And the legacy platforms, the relational database is not designed for how developers think and code, nor is it really designed for performance and scale. And this only gets worse as the intensity and performance requirements of modern applications increase. So developers spend an enormous amount of time working around the limitations of the existing uh, legacy solutions. So that's where MongoDB comes in. So MongoDB was designed by developers for developers. And the way simply to think about MongoDB is to think about a Venn diagram uh, with three circles. One circle is innovation. The second circle is speed. And the third circle is scale. And MongoDB is at the intersection of those, those three circles. And that's why we become so popular with developers. Our software has been downloaded over 155 million times. And there's only 25 million developers in the world. We have over 25,000 customers. Uh, we've grown so fast that we're close to a $700 million run rate business. And that's why we're the most valued independent open source company in the world today. I mean, it's just incredible stats, incredible, um, kind of an incredible overview. And I, I suppose we are going to spend quite a lot of time talking around, um, you know, MongoDB and, 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 and where, where, how it kind of started your entry into MongoDB and of course the incredible journey, your journey um, at, at MongoDB. But I do want to go right to the beginning um, to begin with, Dave, if, if, if that's all right, and, and really understand your kind of journey to, to Blade Logic, because I think th there was an interesting transition for you kind of personally and, and how you grew. So I just want to kind of go right to that beginning. Sure. So I was an engineer by training. And one of the things I realized about myself is that I wouldn't really enjoy sitting behind a desk all day. In some ways, I almost felt like I was a caged tiger, so I had to be let out. And so my passion was really at the intersection of technology and business. You know, what opportunities exist, what problems can be solved that can have the biggest impact. 
How can we do it better than anyone else? And that's really where the action was. And when I started my career, what was interesting is the best technology didn't always win for a couple of reasons. One, because technology decisions in those days were predominantly made top down. Two, it was perceived to be far more risky to use an unproven technology or frankly an unproven company versus going with a brand name. It's that old saying, no one got fired for buying IBM. And three, because large companies had excellent account control because they invested so much time developing relationships with senior stakeholders and the corner office. So it became really hard if you're the underdog to compete. So the only way to really win was to have a great product with a great distribution channel. And in those days, it was all about sales. So when you marry a great product with a great sales force, that's when magic happens. And that was the aha moment I had early in my career. So when did that really start to kind of manifest, you know, within your belief system? Well, again, I started my career at AT AT&T, which was one of the largest companies in the world. And what I saw was that the salespeople at AT AT&T at that time more leveraged their brand to get in the door. And, and, you know, by virtue of of having an AT&T business card, you got access to certain people and you're also stereotyped as a particular type of company. And then I left AT&T to join a smaller uh, telecom company. It's called a CLEC. um, And uh, they were trying to disrupt all the baby bells at the time. And there you really had to start proving that, you know, you had something better. But predominantly, um, I helped launch the data business, but the voice business predominantly competed on cost. So the value proposition was that we're just cheaper than the alternative. Um, So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a very complex sales process, but the data business there, you we were selling new products, frankly, products that the uh, large telcos did not at the time, AT&T uh, did not have. Uh, and, um, and so that's where you start seeing the, the benefit of having a strong sales force. But I would tell you that even there, I never felt like our sales force was firing on all cylinders. I felt like we had a good product and a really good product um, support team, marketing team. But the sales force, because there was a lot of vestiges of the, of the voice culture wasn't as strong as I would have hoped. And then when I went and started my first company, uh, which was Applica, which quickly merged into Breakaway, uh, even then the, the origins of, of, the, of the leadership team at Breakaway, and I was not the CEO, I, was, uh, I, I ran basically the hosting business. Um, they came from a consulting background. And, and as you know, consulting organizations don't have a lot of salespeople. They tend to sell through their own consultants and through senior relationships they didn't really know how to kind of structure an architect or great sales force. And you saw that come to fruition when the world changed, when the bubble burst. They, had, they were very good at demand fulfillment. They weren't very good at demand generation. So as, as the world changed in March of 2020, they really struggled. And that also was seared in me. So when I started Blade Logic, I was very, very committed to building a great product as well as a great sales force. And, and boy, did we make some mistakes, but that was my <laughs> mission. It's interesting because at that point, you knew you were looking for something, but perhaps you didn't know what good looked like. Is, is, is that? That's really well said. Yes, I had never seen a great sales force. And, uh, um, you know, obviously, like I would say in, in the networking telecom world, Cisco had a great reputation. Um, and again, I would say that, um, you know, I, I saw some great reps um, who sold to me, but then I also saw some people who weren't that great. So it wasn't like there was some institutional thing. I saw that, like, wow, this organization is amazing. So when I started Blade Logic, um, you know, I, I, first of all, just to put things in perspective, I had never worked with a software company, let alone led a software company. So I was very self-aware that there was a lot I didn't know. So I asked my board, who's the best software CEO in the local area? Who's the best software CEO? in Boston. And they all said this guy named Steve Walski and said, but by the way, he eats nails for breakfast. He's really hard to get access to. Um, so good luck. They gave me his name and number and basically wished me good luck. So, you know, I, I kept calling Steve and finally I, I, <clears throat> I uh, he returned my call and we decided to meet in downtown Boston and we met my co-founder and I met with him and uh, long story short, at the end of the meeting he said, great, um, I'm going away you know, I'll, I'll give you a call back. So I said, oh, oh, I said, oh, crap. You know, this is one of those classic, don't call me, I'll call you. So I wasn't very confident about what he thought of me. But lo and behold, he called me back. And he actually first joined, um, I got affiliated with Blade Logic more as an advisor. He wasn't in the mood to join another board. 
<clears throat> and uh, he was taking some time off after he had left PTC. But but Steve was the chairman and CEO of PTC. And obviously, you know, in your podcast, you've known how that organization was really the foundation for building an amazing sales force. And obviously, John McMahon ran that sales organization. And so he, uh, he ended up becoming a great mentor to me as a CEO and really helped shape my management philosophy. Uh, and, uh, and so that's when I started recognizing um, the, the need that there was actually a way to build a great sales force. But that being said, the first sales guy I hired at Blade Logic was not from PTC and he didn't last very long. Yeah. You know, he came from another company that had a good track record, but I quickly realized, you know, he was completely in over his head. And so I had to make a change fast. The second leader was a guy named Steve Strahan, who Steve introduced to me, who ended up helping us kind of really get started and really was the foundation of what um, you know, became you know, the Blade Logic we know of today. Dave, did you ever ask Steve why and why he decided to choose Blade Logic and, 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 and take you up on the opportunity? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's all personal. I think he saw a young, you know, highly experienced but energetic, passionate uh, kind of CEO entrepreneur. Uh, for some reason, he connected with me. I still don't really know why. Maybe he felt sorry for me. So like, this guy needs a lot of help. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, one of the things I've learned, and actually one of my philosophies, I think you've heard John say this, like, you know, always be the student of the game, not the master of the game. And that's a philosophy I ascribe to you and I, I coach other people. And it's really helped me because, I, you know, it's very easy for coming as a CEO. Hey, I just raised all this capital. I got these tier one investors. So you all of a sudden think you're a lot better than you are. But I knew, I knew so little about what it took to run a software company. And so I really sought out advice. And I think with Steve, not that I would agree with everything he, he would say, I would listen very intently, ask tons of questions. Why do you do this? You know, what, what the issues? And I think he really enjoyed that back and forth. And he also appreciated the fact that I had some backbone that I'd push back on him when he said something that I didn't agree with because it really made it like a partnership. And I think that's why we connected and that's why he ended up being such a great influence. Incredible. And what I suppose once uh, Steve Strahan and obviously John McMahon thereafter did well, actually tell us how you actually managed to bring John McMahon yeah. in the business because that was that's an interesting story in itself, right? Right. But as with any organization, um, um, you know, you need different people at different stages. John probably would not have joined us, you know, at day zero. We were unproven, unproven product, unproven company, unproven CEO, and John had already had a lot of success. But by the time, you know, we reached a certain scale, it wasn't a massive scale. I think we had, you know, we're on the path of doing about uh, 20 million in, in bookings. It became clear that the existing team was trying to hit a wall. I started becoming increasingly concerned about the state of the sales organization. I felt like things were a little wobbly, that, that I wasn't really confident about our ability to hit our numbers. And, re and I remember, we had raised very little capital. So a couple of bad quarters, and we could be out of cash very, very quickly because you know building a direct sales force is not cheap. So that's when it was the summer of 2005, and I went to visit Steve, and he could tell that I wasn't feeling great. And I, you know, I just said, you know, my gut tells me that you know um, the sales force is, you know, while we we're hitting our numbers, I just didn't feel good about what was going on, and that's really important because even though optically. We were hitting our numbers. I could tell that that something was awry, and um, and I think you always have to trust your gut. And so Steve said, "Well, if you want to look know what a great sales leader looks like, go talk to John McMahon." Now he will tell you that he never thought I would be able to recruit John. He just said, "You go talk to John. You'll kind of get a sense of what a world class leader looks like." Um, and uh, and you know that would be the model by which I would go. You know, try and find someone else. Well, Steve under you know, underappreciated my sales skills. And so I met with John and obviously timing in life is everything. John had been a consultant for a while and I think he was getting travel, tired of being a road warrior. And, um, and he was at a point of trying to, I think, figure out what to do next. He had, he had tried to work with some companies that didn't go very far. And so John and I connected and John obviously knew some of the salespeople we had uh, hired so he could do his own independent validation of does the product work? You know, do customers resonate with what we're trying to do? And, and, and we definitely had a lot of blue chip customers. So I think John saw something in, in, in Blade Logic as well that, okay, here's a company that's kind of hit a sweet spot. They, they definitely need help uh, and I can provide that help. And so it moved really, really quickly. And, uh, um, you know, he joined, I think, in August of 2005 as CRO and we never looked back from there. Incredible. And what was your first impressions of John as an individual? 
<laughs> well, what's interesting is, you know, the prototypical, um, you know, st- uh, persona of a sales guy, is someone who's very, you know, charming, very, you know, very loquacious, um, you know, will, you know, basically dominate a room. And John was not that. He was actually quiet. Uh, obviously, everyone tells you about the intense stare that he has. Like when he, you know, interviews people, people get very inter- intimidated by the fact that he rarely blinks. And um, so he he actually doesn't come across as like you're the stereotypical sales guy. But I actually connected with that. And one of the interesting stories I'll share is you now remember John had already had this amazing success at PTC. He was a well-known person in the Boston and um, you know uh, market. So he could have done a lot of things. And so when he joined Blade Logic, he could have easily said, "Okay, Dave, let me show you how things are done. Why don't you just stand to the side and I'll kind of show you how things." Are done. He actually did not take that atti- attitude. He knew that he did not know our market. I mean, we were selling into the data center, and frankly, you know, I think John would admit this today. He wouldn't know a data center if he tripped over one. So he was very self-aware about things that he didn't know. So he spent a lot of time trying to understand the market, the product, and what was interesting. One day, I walked in the office. And I saw John writing on the whiteboard and kind of talking to himself. He said, hey, John, what are you doing? And he goes, Dave, I'm learning the pitch. And the Blade Logic pitch was not the easiest pitch. Uh, and he says, and I'm saying, why, do you, you know, why are you doing that? He says, well, I, I want to show the sales team that if I can deliver the pitch and deliver it well, no one has an excuse not knowing the pitch themselves. And I thought that was very instructive. Like he never expected um, you know, what of his team that he wouldn't do himself. And so... That showed me a lot about his character and how he, you know, thought about building his organization, which is why I think he has, you know, the following and the allegiance that he does. Yeah. And, and was that the turning point for Blade Logic? Um, in some ways, yes. I mean, obviously, it took time. Um, one of the things I think John did an amazing job is he recruited an amazing, you know, set of people. He recruited like Luca Lazaron, you know, Carlos, you know, uh, Della Torre, Dan Fougere, of course, Cedric Pesh. Um, and uh, so, you know, Jeremy Duggan, there's so many people, uh, you know, that he recruited that were, you know, just amazing, uh, amazingly talented sales leaders. And so that tells you a lot about the quality of a leader. You know, you know, you'll never find a great leader who can't recruit, right? And to me, a test of a great leader is the quality of the organization that can build. And John obviously built an A-plus sales team, which obviously resulted in so many people doing so many amazing things. So that was one thing that stood out in terms of the quality of people he attracted. Um, the second thing is that um, he really understood, once he understood the market and the business, he then constructed a sales process that was designed to you know, qualify deals quickly. You know, we talk about Medic, but Medic was, is layered on top of an existing sales process. And so that obviously, you know, we all know came from the, you know, from the PTC world, but it wasn't like cut and paste. You had to customize it and tailor it for, for Blade Logic. And then, um, and then obviously scaling the organization and putting in the right infrastructure in place to do so was really, really important. And I remember we had very little capital. So one of the things I cared a lot about was the quality of the forecast, right? Because um, if we missed a couple of quarters, we could be in a world of hurt. And so one of the things with John was that the rigor of the forecast was amazing. So by definition, a revenue forecast is also an expense forecast. So when John told me about a forecast, then I knew I could invest in other part of the business to make sure I, you know, we could address that demand. And with forecasting, you also don't want someone to sandbag. Because if you do X, you end up doing like 40% more than X then you actually end up in trouble because then you don't have enough people to service all that business that comes in the door. So being able to actually forecast your business really allows you to run that business very efficiently. And that was something that was incredibly important for us. So obviously a lot of change happening at Blade Logic during this time, uh, changes to the sales organization. How did you have to change to be able to adapt as a CEO to embrace all this change? Well, I was very, again, again, I was very, very committed to building both a great product and a great sales force. So the tone is set at the top and I really treated sales as an equal part in the business. In fact, given John's pedigree and experience, I really treated John as a partner. And I think that's an important skill set for leaders because when you start managing senior people, you have to actually lead by influence, right? I, I'm not, you know, if I start telling John, do this, do that, you know, over time that would wear thin on John because John obviously came with a lot of experience 
you know, John and I would, would be partners. We'd talk about the business, what's going on, what's going well, what's not going well, what do we need to focus on? And he appreciated my perspective and I appreciated his. And that partnership really worked well. And I do that today with my senior team, right? You know, as a CEO, you really lead by influence. You don't lead by fiat. And, and uh, now there's ultimately the buck stops with the CEO. But if I try and tell my senior leadership team to do everything, then, then something is awry. And so that was something that I had to change. Um, and one of the other things is that I learned the hard way is that um, there's, you know, any new CEO tends to have imposter syndrome, right? You know, all of a sudden you're the, you know, the leader of this, this ship and, you know, there's things you've never done before. And you get caught in this trap of trying to portray that you have your arms on everything. And, uh, and you try and show, yes, I'm on top of this and top of that. And we talk to the board and you want to portray that everything is going well. And what I realized, you know, it just put a lot of stress on me. It, I realized that uh, I couldn't know everything about everything. And frankly, I wasn't doing, I was doing the business a disservice, right, by trying to be, behave that way. And one of the big aha moments I, I, I had was that vulnerability is a strength, not a weakness. I don't need to have the answers to everything. I just need to be able to ask good questions. I need to surround myself with good people. And that's how you build a great culture. And, uh, and so that's really paid dividends for me. And so if there's a meeting and I'm the village idiot in the room, people actually relax and say, thank God Dave asked that question because I had the same question, but I didn't want to look like an idiot myself. Right? So all of a sudden, you, know, you have a lot more candor. You, know, you, know, you really talk about authentic issues. There's not a lot of theater where there's a lot of you know, people just trying to say things to sound smart and you really get to the heart of what's, what's, what's really important. This, this imposter syndrome has come up quite a lot, a lot with, you know, I think it's been mentioned three or four times by a few of the other in, individuals that we've had on our podcast. And it's actually an amazing thing to hear that people that have had such success still back, sit back and say to themselves, you know, yeah, am I the right person in the right seat here? It's, it's... Well, it comes back down to, I think, um, your attitude, right? If you have an attitude that you have all the answers, I will tell you that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And many execs that I've seen who fail or stop scaling is because they feel like they've mastered the system, they've mastered their trade craft, and all of a sudden they hit a wall. The best people I know always have that some degree of doubt. You know, what are, what's, what, what are people saying that I, I'm not hearing? You know, what's happening that I'm not seeing? You know, and so you're constantly trying to understand and, and adapt to what's happening. And you just can't cut and paste from a past experience. Every company has its own unique issues, you know, competitive dynamics, customer buying behavior, financing requirements, you know, um, sales cycle times, et cetera. So if you just try and cut and paste, you're going to hit a wall and companies change in different stages. How a company is from zero to 10, 10 to 50, 50 to 100 and so on and so forth. A company needs different, you know, things as it grows. And as a leader, you need to be able to adapt. And so when you have an attitude that you're always learning uh, and that you're always kind of refining your trade craft versus that you're a master of your trade craft, that serves you really, really well. When you do the reverse, that's when you hit a wall. Yeah. So, so Blade Logic built a lot of um, the, the, the playbook on PTC, but actually Blade Logic still trailblazed a lot of the best practice that we see in, in, in the best technology companies in the world. Um, in, including the relationship between sales and pre-sales, that, that whole kind of partnership, um, the way that you, you kind of force management, for example, bringing in force management and, and the impact that that's had. Um, the ICE criteria, which is obviously the acronym around the hiring against aptitude rather than experience. These were a lot of kind of firsts, right? And a lot of that has now really um, tra it transcends even software sales. We're seeing a lot of that kind of touching into many other organizations uh, uh, around, around the world, but a lot of that was really crystallized at Blade Logic. Um, how, how do you view that in terms of those decisions and, 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 and did it come natural? Were you kind of behind all of those decisions? Was it kind of a really symbiotic relationship? Just tell us around, your experience of trail, trailblazing best practice? Well, I, I think you have to really trust your instincts. And, you know, for example, the relationship between sales and pre-sales, the pre-sales organization played an incredibly important role, right? And what we found was that the best salespeople leverage their pre-sales people really, really well. Because sometimes when the salesperson left the room, 
the pre-sales person could uncover a lot more information because now all of a sudden the person, you know, the customer felt more open to talk about the issues and challenges because they may have worried that if the, the sales guy was in the room, he'd use that to his advantage, not recognizing that there was a Trojan horse in the room that was going to go back and tell the salesperson. The other thing is that sometimes technical people connect better with other technical people. So you can go into the next level of detail and have a much more intimate conversation about what's really happening. Uh, and obviously, you know, when you want to convince someone that you have the right technology, the right solution, um, and why your solution is better than any alternative, a lot of that comes down to the technical attributes of the product and who's, who's best positioned to do that is the pre-sales engineer. So that's where I, you know, we felt like there's got to be a very healthy dynamic between sales and pre-sales. And John really reinforced that, you know, across the organization. And when it comes to hiring, yeah, we recognize, I mean, so what was interesting, even starting Blade Logic, we were in the systems management space, right? So we we're competing with companies like, you know, uh, Computer Associates, CA and BMC and HP and Mercury and a whole bunch of other companies. And when I started this company, I remember um, an investor saying, if your idea is so good, why aren't the other systems management companies kind of doing something? And what I realized was that I came from the context of being someone who saw this problem as a customer. And I think that's very interesting because when you look at a lot of startups, it comes from the perspective of you live that problem. So you know that the problem is real. Uh, and we saw that promise in spades and in, in breakaway when we had thousands of servers and all these data centers and we had no tools to automate how to provision and configure and manage the servers. And, and that's what taught me is that you don't, you know, sometimes having experience, you know, might be necessary, but it's not sufficient uh, in a particular domain. What you really want is someone who you think has the right aptitude, who really understands what needs to be done, can learn fast, right? Because in this business, you can never know all the information. You need someone who can learn very, very quickly as new information comes in and adapt um, um, quickly as well. So in, in terms of the momentum thereafter, uh, Dave, so you've obviously got a, a sales organization that is firing on all cylinders. You know, the, obviously Medic is enabling you to really run that forecast. As you say, your, it's your expense forecast almost metronomically. So it's very predictable. At what point did you think, all right, we're onto something really special here? <clears throat> well, I remember um, um, the first year John joined um, was a really pivot year because we started really doubling down and investing in the sales force. And I remember one board member was starting to get a little nervous saying, hey, you know, should we, you know, should we slow down? Because the risk was if he again missed our number, um, it, would, uh, it would have a huge um, and, you know, damaging impact on our balance sheet. And, uh, and obviously, if you then had to, you know, as you know, when you raise capital, when you desperately need it, you know, it becomes a very difficult thing to do. So, so what, we, uh, what was important to me was, could we actually hit these numbers? And the numbers started escalating quite quickly. And um, frankly, I was even nervous. And I remember one quarter, we went from doing 3 million a quarter that to actually go do 8 million that the next quarter. You know, that's quite a significant jump. And we, we, we beat the number. And that's when I realized like, okay, we have something special and we beat the number not by exhausting the pipeline and like, you know, everyone, it was like a death march and then, you know, everyone's exhausted. We beat the number and we felt like we were really positioned to explode after that. So that's when I started feeling like, okay, we had something special. And that's where Steve Walski was also very helpful because obviously he had taken PTC public and he kind of saw the momentum building. That's when he started encouraging me saying, okay, I think it's time for you to start having some broader ambitions. And that's when he started contemplating uh, take the company public. So as a CEO, obviously, accountability stops with you, right? And ultimately, the, the, the whole kind of, the, the whole success of the business come down to critical decisions that you make. That's immense pressure. H how do you manage that decision process? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, one of the things I would say is, um, the CEO role is a very lonely job, right? Because by definition, everyone you talk to has some vested agenda. So if you're debating a decision, if you're talking to your board and your decision requires a lot more capital, they may not be comfortable with that because they don't necessarily want to get diluted if you raise more capital, as one example. If you're making a decision with, and, and you talk to one of your senior execs and that decision means that that person may lose some influence or even power, you know, their feedback might be colored because they may not necessarily want to see that happen. So it becomes very 
uh, you know, in that way, the CEO role is a, quite a lonely role. So it's important for the CEO to have people they can go to and kind of give them unvarnished feedback, unvarnished feedback on, on your ideas and tell it to you straight. And so um, I, I found a couple of people do that. Steve Walski would play that role really well. Um, and one of the things that I also realized was that um, um, bad news travels very slowly up the organization. <laughs> Good news can find me anywhere. I could be an island in the South Pacific. No one has problems interrupting my vacation by saying, Dave, we closed this massive deal. We hired that rock star salesperson or engineer. Uh, the product shipped on time. No one has any problems sharing get, get good news. Bad news though, I have to go looking for it. And one, the thing that I realized was that when I saw bad news, I had to assume two things. One, it was far worse than what people were telling me. And two, I was the last to know. So think of this example. You have a real big product issue at some customer. It, you know, the rep goes, oh my God, this is an effing disaster. By the time it gets filtered up to me, you know, someone will say to me, Dave, we have a slight problem at this company, but we're on top of it. So it's very easy to get inoculated from like bad news because the filtration process that happens as bad news is sent up the food chain is that it, when the sharp edges get kind of sawed off the bad news and it takes a long time to move up. And so that's why I assume that's far worse and I'm the last to know. So as soon as I hear bad news, I start peeling back the onion because I can't be in every meeting. I can't be in every decision. So I have to kind of sample what's going on across the business. And whenever I see something awry, something doesn't make sense, I start digging in. And that's paid massive dividends because that's when you start, as soon as you start digging in, you find out that there's more bad news. And what's interesting is that when you realize there's a problem and then you don't take action, the problem is no longer that person or that thing, the problem is you. So that's important for any leader. So as soon as you realize the problem, you, the, you have the responsibility to take action. You have to go now fix the problem. Now, it's important to create a culture where people can share bad news because you also don't want a culture where if someone shares bad news, you end up shooting the messenger. Guess what? No one's going to share bad news. So you want to create a culture where people are rewarded for bringing bad news quickly because then it's actionable. You can actually do something about it and, in that, and actually engenders trust saying, okay, this company actually cares about what's going on and they're actually focused on solving problems versus just you know, having you know, happy meetings that go nowhere. I think this is such an important uh, uh, sort of philosophy across any form of leadership, right? Is, uh, is creating that, as you said, you know, that trust that they're not gonna get shot by bringing that bad news. But how do you incentivize? You know, what, 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 are, what are some of your you know, techniques in incentivizing that people bring you that bad news? Well, the, the first thing is action, right? So if someone brings you bad news, you actually do something about it. So they say, okay, this person actually cares about this problem. I see a lot of people who either dismiss bad news or kind of you know, basically kick the can down the road. And invariably, you know, as I joke, the only thing that gets better over time is wine. Everything else just gets worse, right? It's that, like that knocking in your car. If you keep ignoring it, you know, you're going to break down on the road one day. And so it really comes down to, do you act on that bad news? Do you thank people for sharing it? Do you engage people in trying to, okay, now that you brought me this problem, um, you know, what do we do about it? And I don't like the, the trope that, well, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Because sometimes people may not have solutions. That's why they're coming to you and saying, I need help. So yes, you may say, well, what do you think we should do? And they say, well, I have some ideas, but I'm not really sure. That's fine. Because if you just say, well, if you're just going to bring me problems, then people are going to say, well, when I have a problem I don't know how to solve, I'm not going to tell you. Well, that's not any good for the business either, right? So you want to create a culture where people are okay to talk about things. And again, vulnerability is a strength. It's not a weakness. And so you create a culture where it's, you know, it's okay to talk about issues and problems. In fact, I always wonder sometimes that's, that's part of my problem is I always want to talk about problems and I sometimes don't always celebrate successes as much as I should. <laughs> I think you've, you've <laughs> highlighted that the, the important role of a CEO is, is, is to be a you know, good identifier of those issues and problems because you know, the successes look after themselves. It's the problems that need careful eye and, and solve them, right? Right. And the other thing about leadership is that you know, if you're a leader of a team or business unit, a sales you know, a group in a particular geographic theater, or you're the CEO or the CRO, the tone is set by your, how you handle things. Like people will mirror how you behave, right? So you have to be very, very intentional about what is the values of the company that you want to create? You know? And so, because again, people will behave the way you behave. 
And so if you have bad behaviors, they're going to mirror your bad behaviors. And if you hopefully have more good behaviors, then they're going to behave, mirror your good behaviors. And so at Blade Logic and obviously at MongoDB, we, we try to be very open and honest with our issues. We try to create a culture of meritocracy. Uh, and, uh, and that's how you attract and retain great people. Dave, you're CEO of one of the biggest technology companies in the world. The amount of you know, issues and th there's so many decisions that need to be taken. H how do you prioritize that bandwidth to make sure that you are focused on the right things and not just being pulled into, into different directions? Well, success is not the absence of problems, it's the ability to deal with them. And the way you deal with them is by having a good team that's very aligned on what the key priorities of the business are, what good looks like and what time frame, And that provides you the framework by which to solve every problem. I will tell you that, you know, today at MongoDB and Frankie and at Blade Logic, I didn't really close that many customers. I don't write any code. In some ways I consider myself almost like the conductor of an orchestra, right? Uh, and I don't really make the music. I don't even necessarily write the music, but I make sure that all the different people in the orchestra work well together, right? And that together we make beautiful music. And that's in some ways how I view my role. Ultimately, my job comes down to three things. You know, I could, let me put it this way. I can do a, you know, 500 or thousand things well, but if I don't do three things well, I failed. What are those three things? One is I gotta be very clear on what the company strategy is. Two, I gotta make sure I have the right team around me that can go execute on that strategy. And three, I need to ensure that we have a culture, an operating system, you know, where we can get things done, that we don't have a lot of bureaucracy, that the company is well financed to invest in areas and opportunities when they, when they see them and so on and so forth. So if I don't do, do those three things well, but I do all everything else well, I failed as a leader. So, so to answer your question, one of the ways, you know, we, we deal with all this is by having a great team. And so I joke that I even joke with my, my chief people officer that I view myself as the glorified or the de facto head of HR because most of my time is spent around people issues. Who's moving up, who's moving sideways, and sometimes who's moving backwards and what do we have to do about that? You, you mentioned kind of an operating rhythm there as well. And I think I just wanted to kind of latch on that. It's, it is one of your playbook elements and it, you've got some very specific philosophies around um, ensuring you have the right operating rhythm. Just tell us a little bit more about some of the tenets of that, of that, of that pillar. Well, I think one, um, I think you may have heard, seen uh, the Eisenhower matrix, which is the two, uh, you know, the, the, the two dimensions of urgent and important, right? So the trap is always focusing on urgent and not, not, focusing on the important stuff because anything that's important that's left unattended will become urgent over time, right? So the degree to which you can spend the bulk of your time on being proactive and on problems and opportunities versus reactive, the better you are. And then the other thing is um, not wasting time on things that you can delegate or just are a time suck that uh, are a waste of time. So for example, when, when COVID hit, I was really, really worried um, at MongoDB <clears throat> that a lot of people would just focus on a lot of things and they'd conflate activity with impact. So one of the things I made very, very clear to everyone is you need to know what your top three priorities are. And if you don't know, you need to make sure you're, you talk to your manager or your supervisor or your VP to be very, very clear what your top three priorities are and how they're connected to the broader company objectives. Second, you need to look at your calendar and ask yourself, does my calendar reflect my priorities? Because all of us only have a finite amount of time. And, and so if your calendar doesn't reflect your priorities and you have to ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? And your calendar also needs to include things for your personal life, other commitments you have, right? So it's, you can't just look at work in a vacuum. And so when you are clear on your priorities and your calendar reflects your priorities, that's how you know you're actually focused on the right things. And so, um, and obviously, don't be shy about asking for help and you feel like you're, you know, you're set up for failure because either you don't have the right skills, knowledge, resources, or uh, expectations, or there's a disconnect on expectations to escalate those things quickly, because there's no point you working on something if you feel like you're going to be set up for failure. So I think that's worked well to help our organization navigate a very, very difficult circumstance, you know, when everyone's working from home you know, cocooned in their own, own apartment or home, 
you know, sometimes you get, you know, especially if you're a new employee, it's like, do, do people even care about what am I doing, right? So you know people care when you know how you, what you're doing is connected to the broader mission of the company. So going, uh, continuing with the theme of kind of operating rhythm, uh, we've obviously heard that you're someone that really understands the importance of the sales culture and really baking that in. But actually, one of the things which is interesting is that the, that you, you, you don't chase the deals in terms of finding the right operating rhythm. There is an orientation around the people, not the deal, which is, which is, which is amazing. Just tell us a little bit more around, uh, around that. Right. So um, one of the things in the sales organization we did very early on at Blade Logic, and we've done it with every other company I've been involved with, which we didn't do, frankly, at Breakaway or other companies, was have poorly business reviews, right, the sales organization. And I sat in on all those reviews. And so some people, some salespeople had been in other companies were shocked that the CEO of the company was you know, sitting in a poorly business review because most, most CEOs kind of delegate that to the CRO <clears throat> or you know, other sales executives. But I really wanted to remember your sales force is an early warning system about what's happening in the market, how your product is working, um, what the competitors are doing, how customers are buying, what objections they're running into, et cetera, et cetera, what opportunities may exist that we haven't thought of. And so this, the QBR was an uh, amazing source of information. But one of the other things we did in the QBR is one of the mistakes a lot of sales organizations make is they focus the whole QBR around deals. What deals are gonna close and why? And they could basically do a, a deal inspection. The problem with that is that all the other people in the room listening about some sales rep talking about their deal, this, there may be some information that's, that's maybe interesting to them, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's very particular to that particular deal. So everyone starts zoning off and doing email. But if you abstract that and say, let's talk about the sales reps on the deal. You know, let's talk about how well are they prospecting? Let's talk about like, what is their pipeline for this quarter and next quarter? Let's talk about, are they good at prospecting, but maybe they're struggling in terms of how they engage with senior level stakeholders. Let's say they're very good at qualifying, but they're not good at prospecting. So the problem is that when they get a deal, they can close it, but their next couple of quarters look pretty slim and thin. And so what are you gonna do? Because this, pro this, this sales rep's not gonna hit their number. When you start talking about those issues, all of a sudden you get everyone, all the other sales leaders attention because they're dealing and struggling with the same way. So the, the predominant focus around our QBRs is around people versus deals. Now you do talk about deals. I don't wanna suggest that we don't ever talk about deals, but I would say 80% of the issues around people and you know, what's going on with them. And we evaluate people on two dimensions, skill and will. Um, one of the best you know, books out there was by Andy Grove and it's called High Output Management, right? And what Andy Grove said was that there's two reasons people fail. They don't have the skills to do the job or the, the, they don't have the will to do the job. So when you, when you ask your leaders to say, map your people on the skill will matrix, you get a sense of like, you know, what the issues are, like what are the skills and knowledge that they may be lacking? And if it's a will issue, what happened? Maybe this person was really, really, you know, uh, doing well, but all of a sudden something, they've hit a wall. Are they having some issues in their personal life? Is there something else going on? Are they frustrated because they feel like they deserved a promotion, they didn't get it, right? It starts exposing a lot of other issues when you talk about people. And so that is a much more comprehensive way of managing business. And the key is to do it consistently, right? So you just can't have one QBR, you know, and then say you're done. The key is to take learnings from that QBR, make sure you have follow through, you know, make sure you agree on an action plan. And then the next time you have a QBR quarter later, say what happened? And now obviously you start seeing a pattern. You know, is it, are people doing what they're saying or are they, you know, saying one thing and doing another? And that's where you can start exposing what the issues are. So July, 2007 IPO, followed by the acquisition of, by BMC, April, 2008, um, incredible, you know, success. Um, and then post BMC, so, you know, post BMC, what, what, once the acquisition and the IPO happened and, you, you know, you had your short stint at BMC, you decided to take some time away. What is it, what were you thinking about at that time in terms of what was next for you? Right, so um, just back to timing, you know, the, 
the time is a funny thing. You can't really predict, you, you can't really plan for it, but timing has, timing has a great impact on life. We raised our first round of financing at Blade Logic five days before 9-11. So you probably wouldn't be talking to me if I hadn't closed that round. And we, we sold Blade Logic to BMC the day JP Morgan bought uh, Bear Stearns for three bucks a share, right? So we kind of had the you know, bookmarks of 9-11 and the credit crisis in terms of Blade Logic's history. And uh, we decided to sell because we realized that uh, the world might be changing and that um, customers may want a broader platform versus just a point solution. And so our biggest competitor, LoudCloud, had sold itself about uh, uh, six months earlier to HP. And, and it was, there was definitely some consolidation happening in the industry. Um, in terms of what I was doing next, you know, I definitely needed some time off. It was a very intense, uh, almost seven years you know, at uh, Blade Logic. But once I started picking my head up, I got a bunch of calls. And one of the, re one of the things uh, I found very interesting is whenever you get called for a CEO opportunity, you realize it's a problem. No one decides, is, hey, things are going so well. Let's, you know, let's mix things up by bringing a new CEO. That never happens, right? When someone says they're looking for a new CEO, the question is, okay, what's wrong? How much hair is on this company and, and is it fixable? So, um, so I got lots of calls for companies that were struggling and I didn't find anything really interesting. I then uh, joined a couple of boards, one of them being App Dynamics, which is great. I met uh, Jyothi, the founder. He was really smart. He was focused on this problem called application performance management. And what was clear is that as applications got decomposed into these smaller piece parts, things like microservices, diagnosing which part of the application was not working well would, would become really, really important. Um, I got involved in the company when the company was really doing about six or $8 million in bookings. Obviously, the company did incredibly well, was on the cusp of going public, and got acquired on the last day of its roadshow by Cisco for close to $4 billion. And I saw that journey. And I learned a lot, again, learning as how customer buying behaviors changed. Um, you know, you learned how, like, um, the end users starting to have more and more influence. Developers started to have more and more influence in technology decisions because software was becoming so central to everyone's business. And you saw the power shift happening from the corner office to the user base. So that was really interesting to watch and observe. I helped recruit some of my alumni to come work at App Dynamics. You know, Jeremy Duggan as one example, uh, a few others, and uh, obviously they did really well and I'm very proud of their results. And, um, and that's when I met actually some VCs. And in particular, I met the folks at Greylock. Greylock was an investor in App Dynamics. And they had a philosophy as they wanted to recruit people who were either senior executives or founders of companies because they could be the best mentors to the next generation of founders because they had actually lived that journey. And so I ended up joining Greylock and Greylock was a fabulous firm. There were early investors in small no-name companies like Facebook and LinkedIn and Workday and Palo Alto Networks. Uh, so, was, you know, I was sitting in a room, I felt like uh, the village idiot when I was sitting in a room with all these people who had invested in these amazing companies it was a great experience. Unfortunately, we had thought about relocating to the West Coast, but for a variety of personal reasons, we decided we couldn't. So, and Grillock was really consolidating its partnership in the West Coast. And so I had a very amicable, amicable separation. I'm an investor in a number of their funds. Uh, and then I joined a small company in Boston called OpenView. And that's where I ran into Datadog. And I made, actually I ran into Datadog at Greylock, uh, but for a number of reasons, I didn't do the investment then, but then I ran to them again, was impressed with their attraction. Again, they were very early. There were sub a million dollars in revenue. Um, and uh, you know, now they're on a path to getting to close to a billion. And I met Ollie and the team there and invested in their B, led their B round. And obviously the rest is history and learned a lot. Again, saw the, saw the systems management world change, saw how developers had enormous um, influence. In fact, they saw the problem of how the dev and ops we're fighting all the time. And they said, we got to, you know, this is a problem that we, if we saw, we think will be, you know, an important problem to solve for almost any organization of any size. And that um, led me. And so what was interesting is through that venture experience, um, I saw this whole trend about next generation databases. So, you know, this is circa 2012. A lot of these next generation databases were being founded or getting financed. And so I saw a lot of them come to the door. I actually looked at a couple quite closely but when I did my diligence, uh, I heard about this company called MongoDB that had much more developer uh, love, had much more, frankly, even then, even though it's a lot smaller commercial traction. So I ended up passing on the, uh, uh, on the investments I was looking at. 
And, and then when I got the call for the CEO call, again, I asked what's wrong. I could go into that. Um, but they said, hey, they're looking to uh, bring a new CEO at MongoDB. I was very happy as an investor. Uh, obviously, it was doing well. But I was intrigued enough to take a meeting and one thing led to another. And I joined uh, MongoDB in September of 2014. Can we ask you what the state yeah. of MongoDB was at the time when you joined and, and what were kind of some of the early challenges they were trying to address? So when I spent time with the company doing my own due diligence, one thing I clearly realized was that the product organization was very strong. That built a really good product. Now, there were some challenges about monetizing technology because it was not easy to monetize open source. But I realized there were some fundamental problems. One, there was a big, big problems in the go-to-market, in particular, the sales organization. Um, the leadership team was a bit balkanized. Um, and in fact, the whole company was balkanized. The salespeople thought the engineers didn't care about making money. And the engineers thought the salespeople were bozos. So there was clearly a lot of problems. And so uh, today, no one in the leadership team that I inherited is, is still with the company. So that tells you how much change that has happened in the six and a half years that I've been at MongoDB. Um, when I joined, the company had done about roughly 30 million in trailing revenue. Now we're roughly at about a $700 million run rate. <clears throat> we had, after a riff I did pretty quickly when I got there, we had about 250 employees. Now we're you know, approaching close to 4,000 employees. Uh, and obviously, you know, um, we have about 25,000 customers. So, uh, so the business has grown fairly quickly since then. Same. So MongoDB at the time you inherited, you said that it didn't have the kind of the go-to-market nailed down. So was it just a matter of you going out and really reaching out to the old, you know, the old crew from the Blade Logic guys, who by that time actually many of them had gone on to be very successful CROs? Did you feel that that legitimizes the power of that playbook? The fact that it was repeated not only once, but so many times, obviously this series is around 33, but so many times, did that give you the confidence to just say, I need to go back and reach out and, and re, re, um, re-establish this playbook? I was trying to look around and all, all my great sales people already were doing well. Like, you know, Anna Marins was doing really well at Okta and, you know, Jeremy, you know, had just had a great win. He wasn't sure what he was, you know, staying on at Cisco. And there are a bunch of other people who were, um, either had taken time off themselves or just weren't ready. So it wasn't like I had this like, you know, long list of people who were ready to jump. So I kind of hired, a, uh, surgically hired a couple of sales execs. And then ultimately I recruited Carlos to become our CRO in December of 2014. And he was really helpful in kind of putting the basic infrastructure in place around things like sales process, you know, medic, um, and, and obviously, you know, um, being very clear on the kind of recruiting pro- profile we wanted. Uh, and so that, you know, started paying dividends very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And the thing I learned as well is one of the, one of the interesting things, you know, you may ask, you know, when you did your diligence, okay, the product was good, but you had a dysfunctional leadership team, you, your sales force was a mess. Um, there were so many issues, you know, some people ask me, why did you, and oh, by the way, there was no success that anyone could point to with open source. The only, there was only one successful open source company and that was Red Hat. So, and oh, by the way, building a database company in New York City, you know, are you crazy? So a lot of people say like, why the heck did you decide to do this? And I would tell you is that you never bet against a product that people love. And one of the things that I quickly realized is that developers love MongoDB. Now they hadn't necessarily figured out how to monetize MongoDB, but developers generally love MongoDB. And I said, that's the foundation that I can build upon. I can fix culture. I can fix go to market. I can fix leadership, but you can't fix product market fit very easily. So if you have a product that the market loves, that's a great foundation to build a company on. And that's what gave me conviction. And what was interesting is I said, and this, and by the way, um, MongoDB was viewed as the best of these next generation databases. So I said, if this company's done so well, with such a dysfunctional go-to-market organization and leadership team, imagine what it could do if there were some great people here. And that's what gave me the inner conviction to join the company. And why is it such an exciting, why, why does MongoDB have such an exciting future in, in, in your opinion now, uh, Dave? Yeah, I think Simon is what I touched about earlier. Is like MongoDB has been really designed by developers for developers. 
the way MongoDB allows developers to build applications. And remember, the biggest challenge a developer had is managing data around an application. Think about an application. What would an application be without data? Think about going you know, to a travel site, to e an e-commerce site, to even something like uh, Craigslist and not having data. You know, it'd be just an empty, you know, um, web, you know, uh, <clears throat> empty page, right? Web page. So it's all about data. And so what MongoDB does is essentially enable people to manage data that much more easily versus all the alternatives. And MongoDB was designed where, uh, around enabling developer productivity. What that really means is that enabling organizations to innovate that much more quickly. And as software becomes so important for companies, the way you innovate is by software. Think about any website you go to today. Your perception of a company is, is, is made by how you interact with a website. Does it look clean and modern? or is it slow and clunky, right? And so how you build your brand, how you engage with the customers and your partners and even your employees has a huge correlation to what people think of you. And so software becomes really the way by how people run and transform their businesses. And the data is the, is the, is the most critical layer of that software application. So MongoDB has been designed to serve today's modern applications around innovating, you know, quickly iterating and scale. We have companies who are using massive amounts of data on MongoDB uh, for a whole host of reasons. And if you look at our customer base, there's not one industry, one geography, and one use case where someone's not using MongoDB before. And so from the largest companies in the world to cutting edge startups using MongoDB, and that's what really gives me a lot of confidence about our future. Amazing, amazing. So Dave, I think this is the point where we ask the final question of the episode, which is, um, does the hunter make the unicorn? <laughs> uh, Simon, Ali, I would tell you most definitely yes. It's obviously for B2B companies. Um, the lesson I've learned the hard way is that the only way you build a great business by marrying, is by marrying a, a great product with a great distribution channel. And that's essentially what we did at Blade Logic. And that's what we're trying to do at MongoDB. And when I look at all the great software companies, the B2B software com companies today, I can't think of one who doesn't have those two elements um, in there. And so the answer is most definitely yes. Fantastic. Dave, I've actually got one final question, sorry, which is, I think one which is really important. I think the viewers would be really interested to hear, but what gets you out of bed? What is your biggest driver? You know, what? What is it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, get, uh, I get this question a lot, actually, from uh, even our own employees. And um, what I, you know, what, what I want to do is really create a company for the ages. Like, um, you know, it's interesting. John McMahon talked about this in his podcast. He says a lot of people view their value as like, hey, when I was there, the company was doing well. When I leave, the company fell apart. So by definition, I was a great leader. That's not the definition of great leadership. The definition of great leadership is putting the foundation in place that the company can continue to soar even when you're not there. And my vision for that is I tell employees, imagine you're walking down the street and imagine you walk by a building that's got the MongoDB logo there. And maybe you're with your partner, maybe you're with a friend, maybe you're even with your child. And they look at you and say, hey, you were there in the early days of MongoDB. Tell me how it was. Tell me what, you know, what it was like. And, that, and you look at them and, and you look at them with a sense of joy, satisfaction and say, oh my God, the experiences I gained, the skills I developed, and the relationships I built will last for me, last with me forever. That's what I really want. And that's what really gets me out of bed in the morning. Wow. What a humble answer. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. And, and Dave, I think it's a really fitting end. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, this is the very last episode of the final episode of the final series dedicated to this incredible story. Um, and I have to say that it's been an incredible journey because we've been able to, to, to interview some of the most prolific, inspiring, thought-provoking leaders um, in technology. And spending time with you today, again, it's so clear to understand why this success has been so, not necessarily predictable, but the fact that it's so repeatable um, and that there are so many common traits amongst this group, which 
have been able to facilitate not only success, but drive change and innovation. And I think I just want to latch on to one of the things that I think resonated most with today's interview for me was that the, the, you mentioned it a couple of times, which is vulnerability is a strength. And I think at the very heart of everything we've seen is this thirst to go out and learn and not to be scared to say, do you know what? I don't have all the answers, but actually I do have the right questions. And that's always going to serve me well. And I think that that mindset starts at the top and really goes through every part of the business throughout, through the sales organization, through pre-sales, through product, through operations, through every single part of the business and, and, and through this group. And I think that this has really helped you all be so successful. And um, I suppose one of the things that this series is aimed and one of the ambitions of this series is to show that this isn't just a one-off. This is something which is repeatable. There is real substance here. And hopefully this can inspire a lot of people to go out and learn and really investigate this and, and study this success and learn from it and have success of their own. So I just want to take this opportunity today, Dave, to really just thank you for 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 for. For, for your participation, but also for being such an inspirational leader to have really been crucial for the success and this amazing story that we're, that we're covering. Well, um, Simon and Ali, I actually want to thank you for, for really telling the Blade Logic story because if it wasn't for you. Um, I think a lot of people would not know what happened at Blade Logic. And uh, I also want to tell you, it was great to hear voices of old colleagues that I hadn't talked to in a long time, people like Phil Pergola and Devaka Prabhakar. Obviously, Sahir Azam is now with MongoDB, but like just hearing the stories and they, they, the stories they told, I actually some of them I'd forgotten about. And, uh, and so thank you so much for telling the story. And obviously, I, I want to just acknowledge the great team that we had at Blade Logic. Yes, I was a CEO, but it was, it was really a team effort. And, you know, I'm humbled by what they did at Blade Logic and I'm humbled by what they've done, gone on to do after Blade Logic. So I'm really proud of, of, of all of them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure, a real honor, um, and, uh, and definitely um, a milestone point in my life. So thanks so much for taking time for uh, uh, your time today, Dave. Thank you. So to our, to our listeners and to our viewers, this is the last episode of this particular series, but we're very pleased to announce this is not the end. This is the beginning. There is lots more great content that we're working on at the moment. So please do look out for uh, announcements on our website. Please do check out so muchsoap.com forward slash blog for more information. And we look forward to welcoming you again for the next series. <laughs>